Good morning, everybody. Good morning. God bless you. We've now come to the talk we've all been waiting for. And we're still waiting. You know, looking back on my childhood and my early teenage years, I never had the talk with my father. We never had the talk. I knew where he stood. I never found a Playboy magazine in our house anywhere. In our garage, there was no calendar with nude females pictures on the calendar. He never said a dirty joke, never heard the F word come out of his mouth. He just didn't talk much about his life. If he ever had a girlfriend before he met my mom, I don't know. I still even have, never asked my mom. Maybe I'll ask her next time I talk to her. So we never had the talk. Sort of wish we did. My wife has had the talk with our six daughters, and I've had the talk with my one and only son. We do that on a weekend away we call Passport to Purity. And so the talk is really important. I think it's important to have this talk in the church. I think that churchgoers want to have the talk with their pastor. And so let's do it, okay? So why am I doing this particular talk? Because I'm insane. That's why I'm doing this talk. <laughs> I've got nothing better to do than ruin my summer vacation thinking about this talk that's coming up. At the outset, let me say, I have no intention from the bottom of my heart to condemn anybody, to put guilt on anybody, to heap any shame on anybody for how you might be living or have lived in the past. That is not what this is all about. This series is called Counterculture because we are called to engage the culture. Jesus says, you are in the world but not of the world. You be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And when we engage the culture, we're going to have to, at times, counter the culture because obviously the culture is not always going to go along with God because God's a holy God. So when the culture veers away from where God's mor morals and priorities are, we have to engage them. The bad news is a two-hour sermon. The good news is we'll let you out at the end of the two hours. Just kidding. I've got 40 minutes to put this two hours into 40 minutes. Where do we start? Let's just start from the beginning. If you have a Bible, took the, turn to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, just look up on the screen and please stand. And let's read Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Genesis 1.26 says this. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Let's pray. Lord, right now as we look uh, at this passage and others, would you speak to our hearts? Would you give us ears to hear? And Lord, may whatever decisions or beliefs we arrive at be consistent with your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So my big idea this morning is this. Once you find your identity in Christ, once you find your identity in Christ, then you'll be able to grasp that it's not about how I am, it's about who I am. Once you find your identity in Christ, then you can grasp it's not about how I am, it's about who I am. We're going to look at creation, then we're going to look at fall, then we're going to look at redemption. First, creation. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, then God said, God speaks. He says, 
Let us make mankind in our image. Let us, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make God creates. And in our image or in his image is mentioned three times here, in his image. This means all people, men, women, boys, and girls, no matter your identity, your orientation, your beliefs, your practices, what you've done or will do, you are made in the image of God. You have a, not only a body, you have a soul and a spirit. The birds in the, in the sky, the fish in the sea, the animals in the ground, but now man is made in the image of God, which sets us apart. And notice it says God made them male and female. God created gender. Genesis 2, 18 to 25. Next chapter, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The first time in the Bible God says something is not good is when he says it's not good for the man to be alone. As a church, we need to remember that people feel alone at times and lonely. We need to be a church that brings community. That's why we're called Mountain View Community Church. And God says, I will make. He sees that Adam is alone. He says, I've got to do something about this. So I will make him a helper. This is the first surgical operation in the Bible. Dr. God. Wouldn't it be great to know that when you went in for surgery that God was doing the surgery? He wouldn't need a nurse. He wouldn't need a helper. He wouldn't need anesthesia. He's just going to put you under and bring you back out. And when you come out, you've lost a rib. That's all. <laughs> he puts Adam in the deep sleep. And he wakes him up, and he says, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In Hebrew, that's translated, she's hot. <laughs> no joke, that's what it says. She's hot, she's fine, isn't she? That's what he says. I mean, he's been looking at elephants and lambs and turtles, and now he's like, man, she's, she's for me. And that is God's design. A man and a woman in a monogamous union, naked and unashamed, experiencing sex. Three purposes for sex. Get out your Sharpie and write them on your hand. <laughs> the three Ps. P number one, procreation. Genesis 1.28. Increase in number and fill the earth, procreation. P number two, pleasure. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, pleasure. And P number three, oneness. <laughs> it's one letter away from P. It's so close. PPO. United and become one flesh. To experience what God created for you in a sexual union, you got procreation, pleasure, and oneness. So again, sex, if it's God's will, sex is God's will for you if done so in a marital relationship between one man and one woman. That's just, remember, I'm your friend. I'm your pastor. I'm your best friend. We got a lot of good pastors. I'm the nicest. Remember that. Steve's second, right there. Welcome back. Give it for Steve. Welcome back. The challenge in all of this is that if 
Pastor Guy, if you're right, this is the problem. If sex is designed in a marital relationship, the man and woman, we got a humongous challenge on our hands because nowadays people are getting married later and later and later in life. Right? So did you know that in the 50s, was anybody alive in the 50s or getting married in the 50s? All right. Well, no one's getting married in the 50s, but anyway, anybody get, maybe a few people. Average age of a woman getting married in the 50s was 20. 1980, 22, 1990, 24, and in 2017, 27.5. For men, in 2017, 29.5. Partly due to that 29% increase in cohabitation since the last 10 years. But if you take your kid to passport to purity at 12, and they get married at 29 and a half, that's a long time to wait, right? You're telling me I can't, I'm going to have to wait that long. And it's so hard on people. That's what God says. By the end of Genesis 2.25, everything's awesome. Adam has got the most gorgeous wife. I think about it. No sin in the world. She must have been a 10 out of 10, a 100 out of 100. And Adam, he was no slouch either. He must have been a pretty handsome guy. You've got the perfect couple in the perfect garden with the perfect God and everything's perfect until chapter 3. <laughs> you ever go on vacation like it's so awesome and it ends with a bad last night? You know, someone's fighting in your family. Not in my family. Um, in your family. <laughs> Chapter 3, Adam is so dumb. He's got the world by the tail. He's got the perfect wife, the perfect God, the perfect garden. And he's got like a million of trees to eat from. He's like, but you know what? Yeah, I know I'm not supposed to eat of that one. But let's see what it tastes like. Dumb. Let's see what it tastes like. And the wages of sin is death. And he eats the forbidden fruit and bzzz, crash and burn. The whole human race falls. Theologians call this the fall. Chapter 4, one chapter there, Lamech marries two women. Polygamy. Chapter 16, Abram, godly Abram. Christians can sin too. Godly Abram, told he's going to have a son. Can't wait. Sarah can't give him a son. He's like... Sarah, would you mind if I just slept with, uh, with my maid, Hagar, because then we'll get a son? She's like, yeah, whatever, Abram. And she, he sleeps with, it, with, with Hagar, infidelity. She gives birth to Ishmael. Just wait. You would add Isaac a few years later. And now Isaac and Ishmael, the Jews and the Arabs, have hated each other for 5,000 years. Thank you, Abram. Your sins of infidelity are going to ruin your family. Keep that in mind. Chapter 18, homosexuality, Sodom, and rape. Chapter 19, Lot's daughters want to sleep with their father a lot. That is incest. In chapter 38, Judah and Tamar engage in prostitution. And people say, the Bible is such a boring book. I'm like, have you ever read Genesis? Uh, now Leviticus is a boring book, <laughs> but Genesis is pretty cool. So what about today? Well, let's just even go to the first century. I'm going to be preaching the book of 1 Corinthians starting next month. In Corinth, there was a verb in Corinth, Corinthianize, which means to practice sexual immorality. They, they coined a verb to practice sexual immorality because that's what everybody was doing in Corinth when Paul came in to plant the first church. Demosthenes, one of their writers, a few hundred years before Paul got there, said, Mistresses, we keep for our pleasure concubines for our day-to-day -day physical well-being and wives, they get to bear us legitimate children and to serve as trustworthy guardians over our, our own households. That was the view of men in first century Corinth as well. Things 2,000 years after Paul wrote to Corinth aren't much different, aren't much better. Pornography. Latest studies have shown that 40 million Americans regularly visit porn sites. 40 million Americans regularly visit porn sites. 55% of married men watch porn at least once a month. 
25% of married women watch porn at least once a month. I used to think you talk to the men about porn. Now you got to go, no, it's not just the men. So women, 70% of unmarried men watch porn at least once a month. Sexting, 27% of teens receive them and about 15% are sending them. And the average age of someone who's first exposed to porn is age 11. Porn increases marital distress, decreases marital intimacy, and is a contributing factor in separation and divorce. So men, if you're looking at porn, what is wrong with you? I mean, what is wrong with you? That has to stop on August 18th, 2019 at 12 15 p.m. It has to stop. What does the Bible say? Let's look at some things. First, lust. I'm just going to read these quickly. Jesus talks about lust. Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you should not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in, with her in his heart. The Bible says it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Lust is sex without consent. It's mental rape. Lust is sex without consent. Now, it's not wrong to say she's a pretty girl, he's a handsome guy. That's not lust. It's beyond that. I think we understand. Second, what about fornication? What about premarital sex? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before, for God does not call us to be impure but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, Remember, Jesus Christ was punished for our sins in our place. And if we come to Jesus Christ, we're released from the punishment of our sins. Keep that in mind. But this is saying we should avoid sexual immorality. The Greek word is porneia. It applies to premarital sex. Porneia can apply to all range of sexual sins. But here I think this is saying, what's wrong with fornication? It's sex without commitment. It's sex without commitment. Third, adultery is also sex without commitment. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now, maybe you've realized, I know what Pastor Guy is doing. That is what Pastor Guy is doing. Because I think a lot of people thought I was just going to talk about homosexuality today, and I am. But there is enough sin going on among heterosexuals in our world, in our community, and in churches, that before we start talking about homosexuality and same-sex marriage, we need to look at ourselves in the eye and say, how are we doing, right? Yeah. That's where it starts. And that eliminates all kinds of judgmentalism. So we got to start with, with those who are heterosexual. But we have to talk about homosexuality. So, Leviticus 18, 22 says this. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Leviticus 20, 13. If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. And then carried over to the New Testament. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, nor men who have sex with men. In that context, you have the active man and the passive man. We'll talk about that when we get to 1 Corinthians. So the Bible, I could look at other verses. I don't think we have time for that. You can look them up yourselves. Homosexuality is sex without completion. Lust is sex without consent. Fornication is sex without commitment. Homosexuality is sex without completion because a man and a woman, a man and a man cannot complete each other. A woman and a woman cannot complete each other. 
They cannot compliment each other. God said, I'll make a helper suitable for him, and he made a woman. And so that speaks to this. In the Old Testament, when it says that's detestable, they'll be put to death. Let's keep in mind that the Old Testament also taught that if you committed adultery, you could be eager to be put to death too. So, theological lesson, Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Testament, New Covenant. Old Testament, the Jews are under God, the theocratic government. New Testament, it's the Church of Jesus Christ, separation of church and state. Don't get that confused. Under the Old Covenant, you could be put to death. Under the New Covenant, God will deal with sinners differently. For example, I don't want to use me as an example, but I will. All right. If I committed adultery, I would not be stoned to death, but the elders of the church would say, mm, thank you for your 22 years. Here's your severance package. God bless you. Because you can't have the senior pastor committing adultery. If any of the elders of the church committed adultery, they could still come to church here. I mean, as long as they got back with their wife and aren't bringing their new girlfriend here, you know what I'm saying? But they couldn't be elders anymore because they've disqualified themselves from leadership. So God still deals with people and disciplines them, but we're not talking about, we, we should not be shooting people, stoning people who commit sins. We all commit sins. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. So what about same-sex marriage? Matthew 19, 4 to 5. Jesus said this. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So talking about marriage, again, Jesus goes back to Genesis and says, hey, guys, haven't you read? Remember, the Creator made them male and female, and for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. That's, in, that's, that's what marriage is to God and, and, and to Jesus. Remember, what man condones, God doesn't always approve. God doesn't approve of an adulterous relationship, and God isn't going to approve of a same-sex marriage either. He's still going to love them, right? So we need to keep all that in mind. So it's hard to talk on subjects like this, and it's easy to take a different position because we all have friends, don't we? We all have friends. I have a cousin, and she... 10 years ago, married an older woman. And I have a neighbor, a young, wonderful man that we love who's engaged to another man. And, and you have, and I have friends, you know. And the question, though, is, do we just show grace or do we bring truth in as well? We speak the truth in love. And I believe that's what I'm called to do and that's what the church is called to do and be. If someone's living with their girlfriend or a girl living with their boyfriend, get married or break up. Break up or speed up. Break up or speed up because that's what God wants for you to do. Genesis 128 says God blessed them. God wants people to experience the blessing of God, but to experience the blessing of God, we want to live in the will of God. Does that make sense? All right, Pastor Guy, what about transgenderism? It's becoming more and more common. What about transgenderism? I got an email this week from a man in our church. He said this. When I went for, and this is this week, when I went for a regular doctor's appointment yesterday, I was given a form to update with three additional questions. Number one, what is your sexual orientation? Number two, what are your preferred pronouns? Number three, what gender do you identify with? And he was just taken aback by it. He was like, I've never had to answer questions like that before. But our culture has changed so fast. So fast. And I know he wasn't pleased with that. That's our culture today. How do we speak to our culture I have a picture here of C.C. Teffler. C.C. two months ago ran in the Division II Women's Track and Field National Championships, and she came in first in the 400-meter hurdles, and her next closest 
person was about a second and a half behind her. She did like 57 some seconds. And she won the national championship in Division II. Cece Te Telfer, excuse me, Telfer. A year and a half ago, her name was Craig, and he ran in the boys' championships, same race, and came in eighth out of nine. But he's had a year off, and NCAA division rules allow that. If you have a, a one-year break like that, they feel you can compete without a, an advantage. Probably a lot of us would think she had an advantage. But I don't think that's the important thing here. See, what is sad is that she may or may not have had an advantage in her track race, but she's not going to have one in life. She's going to regret, he is going to regret the day he changed his gender because God, he was conceived a boy, born a boy, raised a boy, become a man, and God's design is stay a man. And that's what is going to hurt people. And so we need to think, well, what do we say? Three things. First, I think we need to respect those who are transgender and love them, be their friend. Legally, you're a doctor, you're a school teacher, you're going to have to call them by the name they prefer. You're going to have to call them by the pronouns they prefer. As your friend, if you, as your friend, you kids go to high school, public school? I know. You go to Brandon High School, Langer, Weber School. You know transgender kids. Be their friend. Be their friend. Sit with them at the table. Earn the right to be heard. And at some point, tell them, about Christ and the truth. What about intersex? Intersex. I didn't know anything about intersex until about the last year because everything's changing, isn't it? One of the books we're selling, Cheap in the Lobby of Gender, a conversation guide for parents and pastors. He writes, intersex people are individuals who have ambiguous genitalia or a mix of male and female genitalia, sex, internal sex organs, or chromosomes. Intersex people are frequently used as a trump card argument by pro-transgender people in this debate. Such people account for about 0.05% of the population, or one in almost 2,000 people, according to the Intersex Society of North America. As difficult as the situation is, the intersex comparison is a red herring, a distraction to the transgender discussion. Why? Because transgender people do not have ambiguous genitals. They have clearly defined genitals, but they want to live in a way that doesn't match their physical makeup. And so I think we need to keep in mind that that's not a, the, the intersex topic is not a rationale to say transgender is, is good and should be pursued. Because it's not about their bodies. It's about their minds, right? It's when people think their thinking or their feelings trump what their body says is true of them is when people get in trouble. So let me give you an example. In 1996, I led a missions trip in our church in Iowa, about 15 teenagers. And one of the girls, who was about 17, Amy, Beautiful young lady, wonderful Christian home. But every night, we had to pull the scale out, and she had to step on the scale, and we had to weigh her because she was anorexic. I remember one meal. You know, teenagers were having pizza. You got to have pizza. She's got a piece of pizza on her plate, and she never took a bite. She just went like that, and she took piece of pepperoni or a piece of cheese. That's how she ate her pizza. And I'm thinking, just eat the pizza because you are way underweight. But her mind is telling her she's overweight. She feels like she looks in the mirror and she's overweight. But everybody knows she's not. 
the worst thing you could do, the absolute worst thing you could do is say, Amy, you're right, you're fat, don't eat, because she's going to die and starve to death. And so we can't tell people that what they think and feel is the absolute truth because they're not thinking straight. And that's what's happening in high schools and elementary schools and even with adults who are transgender or pursuing that. And the counselors and the psychologists, they don't know what to say. But God would say, you know what, your nine-year-old girl, we're going to keep calling you a girl's name because you're a girl. Parents, if your child, elementary, middle school, high school, comes to you and thinks that maybe I should be a boy or maybe I should be a girl, you're going to have to hold the line. The worst thing you're going to do for your kid is let them change their gender. As a church, that's why we have to be inviting. We all need to be in our culture. We need to be friends with the gay community, the transgender community. We need to be friends with all people and the heterosexual community, right? Because 10 years from now, they're going to say, we've ruined our lives, we've ruined our bodies, where can we find a refuge? And I hope the Church of Jesus Christ can be that for these people. Amen? Amen. I guarantee you, people are going to regret the surgeries they've had, because it's not of God. We need to view people like transgender, like anorexics, with compassion and be humble, because Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, we all, we all have sinned, whether it's lust or this or that. You know, we've all messed up. We, we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of God's glory, and we need, we need to to point people to that and not be condescending. Martin Luther, the great theologian 500 years ago, said, we are all mere beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. So where's the bread? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who believes in me will never go hungry, but will have eternal life and the light of life. Jesus is the bread. Creation says this, we've fallen but then there's redemption. Romans 3, 23 to 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Redemption means we've been redeemed from the slave market of sin, that we've been under an oppressive king who has kidnapped us, but Jesus can take us out of that. First, he can cleanse you, he can forgive you of all your sins, and he can set you free, right? And so that's what this is all about. Rosaria Butterfield is one who's redeemed. I highly recommend. In the back of the, the bulletin, I've given you reference books and stuff in addition to what we have in the lobby. She was a gay rights activist in the 90s in New York City. Is it hot in here? Sorry, it's hot outside. Maybe we can open those doors a little bit. Open those doors out there a little bit. Um, she had some male relationships. Then she had a lesbian relationship. And by 28, when she got in her second lesbian relationship, she says, I now know who I am. I'm gay. At 28, she came out, I'm gay. She said, I, it was like I went from black and white to color. This is who I am. She was a professor at Syracuse University. She taught English, and she wrote, she taught courses on queer theory. And then she decided to write and publish an article about why Christians hate us. And we don't. She called it the religious right. And she wanted to do her research. And so one pastor contacted her and said, could I help you? I'd like to invite you over for dinner with my family. She wrote in her book, she drove up to the door and sat in her car and was like, do I get out of my car and go in there? I'm going on enemy turf. And she went in there. And over the next two years, she went back to their home over 500 times. She found a place of compassion. She began to read the Bible. And after reading the Bible, she said, you know what? This book is true. Two years later, she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. 
found he's the bread of life. And then she pulled out of her lesbian relationships. And today she's married to a man. She's a homeschool mom today. Can you believe that? And there's a podcast. I put it on the back of your bulletin. God, this is the podcast. The most amazing I've heard. A podcast of her just came a couple weeks ago. And she's been redeemed. And God can do that. The Bible says, such were some of you. We all have sinned and fall short. We all can have a new life, and he can change us. But at the same time, not everyone has this instant deliverance. Not everyone does. Galatians 5.17 says that the flesh wars against the spirit and against the spirit against the flesh, so that you do not do what you want to do. So it's not always instant. So for instance, here, I've got a, a photo here of Pastor Greg Johnson. Greg Johnson, pastor in the Presbyterian Church in America. This is a picture from two months ago where at his general assembly in his denomination, he got up and he said, when I was 16, I was gay. When I was 20, I met Jesus. And now I'm in my mid-40s and he's a pastor. And you know what? He still has same-sex attraction. And so he is a single man who has chosen celibacy knowing he's like, I'm never going to have kids because this is who I am. He's not... I'm not a gay man. I'm a child of God with same-sex attraction, and that's his story. Next picture, Pastor Sam Alberry. We are offering his book, which is amazing, in the lobby. Is God anti-gay? He, too, is a single pastor who struggles with same-sex attraction. Have you ever gotten a thought in your mind and you couldn't get rid of it? You know what I'm saying? Have you ever, like, been hurt by somebody, and whenever their name comes up, you're like, ah, you know, and it's been 38 years, you know what I'm saying? Okay, 20 years, all right? Give you a break. Have you ever had that, and you're like, what is wrong with me? What's wrong with you is you were born a sinner because Adam's an idiot, right? That's what's wrong with you. You were born as a sinner. We have a sin nature, and that's what we bring to it. And for some people, I think some people that fall in nature, they have same-sex attraction. That doesn't mean you, you, you live by that. You fight that, but you have to choose celibacy. What did Jesus say in Matthew 19? He said, there's three kinds of eunuchs. One, there's some who are born that way. Second, there's some that are made that way. And then there's third, there's others who have chosen to be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. There's nothing wrong with being single. You don't have to be married to experience the blessing of God. But some have to choose celibacy because they know they can't feed off of their lusts that are not meant to be. So as the worship team comes up, we just want to close by remembering this, and that is that it's all about identity. It's all about identity. Once we find our identity in Christ, then we can know it's not how I am, but it's who I am. It's not how I am, but who I am. In Mountain View, we want to be a safe place for everybody. Three people I want to talk to, three groups of people. First, those who are homosexual or leaning that way or think they might be. Remember, if you have same-sex attraction, that doesn't mean you're gay. Don't ever listen to the culture say that means you're gay. That doesn't mean that. Teenagers, that doesn't mean you're gay. It just means you had a same-sex attraction thought or whatever. If you're in a gay relationship, even if you're so far as you're married to a man, you're a man or a woman to a woman, my advice is, Figure that out later. Come to Jesus today. Amen. Just come to Jesus. He'll help you figure that out tomorrow, next week, next month. Um, Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller in New York City, was interviewed recently. And the, the interviewer was a little bit of a cynic. And the interviewer said, So does homosexuality send you to hell? And he gave him the answer. And the man said again, so, but does homosexuality send you to hell? And he's like, stop. <laughs> he said, why would homosexuality send you to hell if heterosexuality doesn't send you to heaven? <laughs> does anybody understand? Yeah. 
Man, the first service, everybody was, was with me, all right? <laughs> Let's make it clear, all right? When you die, if you die today, I hope nobody dies today, and you stand before God, and God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? And you say, well, because I'm a, I'm a heterosexual. <laughs> That's not going to work. Guys are going to say, oh, you're in because you're a heterosexual. You're not in because you're a heterosexual, and you're not out because you're a homosexual. That is bad theology. You're only in for one reason, because none of us deserves to get in. For all have sinned and fall short of the God. God's a holy God. He has to punish sin. The only way you can get in is you realize Jesus died in your place. You said, I'm humble enough to admit that I don't deserve to go to heaven, right? And every person needs to know that. Lord, would you forgive me and save my soul? And the only reason I'm going to get in, Lord, I want to get in, because I clung to Jesus, and he's going to say, you're in, buddy. Gays don't go to hell because they're gay. Heterosexuals don't go to heaven because they're heterosexual. Do you know Jesus? And even if you know Jesus, you're still going to sin in whatever way, shape, or form. The transgender, if you're transgender, think about transgender, I just want to tell you that you are so precious to God. And he looks down on you and he wants to hug you and hold you and cry with you and love you and be your best friend. And you don't have to have an operation to become somebody you're not because he made you and he doesn't make any junk and you're the way you're supposed to be. And that's the gospel, okay? And for those of us here, heterosexual, heterosexual, your problem isn't same-sex attraction. Your problem is OSA, opposite sex attraction. (laughs) Your problem is you can't stop lusting or going to porn sites or this or that. And so you, if that's you, you got to stop that too. And remember, God's called us to live a pure life. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, right? And Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. But Jesus can put even Humpty back together, right? And he can put you back together. And that's the gospel. It's all about Jesus. Mountain View, come here. I don't care how many sins you've committed. Come through these doors and we're going to love you, hold your hand and pray with you because this is the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus loves you.